thanks so much for being with us for this for this webinar that we're calling Farm Financing with USDA Loans. We have almost an hour of information for you and discussion with you. And what we're going to do is start with um, a pre-recorded, some pre-recorded information on the Farm Service Agency loans and the process of, of going through that. And then after that, we're going to hear from an actual farmer who's been through that process and done very well with it. And we'll come back for Q&A. And this is, this is a webinar, or this is a, more like a meeting, so there can be some discussion between us. And then after we talk with our farmer, I'll turn it over to my coworker, who is our resident uh, cooperative uh, business expert. My name is Aisha Reyes. You're going to hear this in the video, um, but we're going to get started with that, um, with that video now. Thanks again for being with us. Welcome, and thank you for joining this installment of the Center for Sara's Lunchtime series of webinars. My name is Aisha Cruz Reyes, and I'm a project director for Sara. A quick overview of what SADA is and does is that we are a center within the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley, where we focus on agriculture and rural businesses. We partner with UTRGV faculty who are teaching and researching ways to make agriculture more sustainable. But mostly we spend a lot of time with producers in the Rio Grande Valley, helping them to farm more sustainably. And we're also helping them and rural businesses to find alternative sources of capital, usually through grants. I'll give you some more information about how to get a hold of SADA a little later, because I'd like to move on to our session. Our topic today is farm financing with USDA loans. I know that there are several options, maybe a lot of options, for how to finance your farm or ranch, either the land or the operation itself. I'm going to cover one source of financing today, and that is the USDA Farm Service Agency. So in this half hour that we're together, we're going to review a very accessible tool online for farmers and ranchers. It is provided by USDA at the farmers.gov webpage. The web address for that is www.farmers.gov loans. And what you'll do is scroll about halfway down the page and find a heading that says Loan Application Quick Guides. They're guides for individuals, entities, microloans, and youth loans. And then all of these are also available in Spanish. The one we're going to look at today is the Application Quick Guide for Individuals. Let's talk about why you should consider an FSA farm loan. The first reason is probably the lower interest rates. These are usually much lower than a commercial bank would offer. It can be as low as 1.5% APR, but it depends a lot on the market situation. And usually they hover around 3%. Also, there's usually no down payment for an FSA farm loan. The third reason is that repayment terms are very much in tune with the farmer's business cycle. Rather than requiring, say, a monthly payment like a regular bank would, FSA makes accommodations for farmers who harvest months down the road or when livestock is ready to be sold quarterly or just semi-annually. It's on a different repayment schedule. Fourth, FSA farm loans are made for customers who are having trouble getting a reasonable rate and reasonable terms at their regular bank whether it's because of credit history or other kind of existing debt, farm service agency loans are for people who don't have, aren't in the best credit situation, but still could still show good repayment ability. There are some eligibility requirements for being able to take out an FSA loan. First, you have to be a citizen or a legal resident of the U.S. You also have to be at least 18 years old unless you're going for a youth loan. And you have to be mentally capable, competent, and able to be responsible for that loan and all the requirements that come with it. You cannot have had any federal or state violations, and these include violations for controlled substance that would make you ineligible for any federal loan. 
it's really important that you can show in your application, in your business plan, in your financials, that you're going to be able to repay the loan. Federal program or not, FSA needs to be able to see that this is something that you can pay back. You're going to make enough money to be able to repay it and use the money wisely. Any individual that applies for a loan has to be a family farm. The family members need to be very active in the operation and not just the management of the farm. By the same token, you have to be an owner operator. So very involved in the day-to-day -day activities of running the farm. And there has to be available collateral to cover the amount of the loan. It's going to be at least 100%. They can ask for as much as 150%. And it can be in the form of real estate or livestock, equipment, even the, the products that you actually harvest, those can all be used as collateral. There are also some credit guidelines to be able to, to qualify for an FSA farm loan. One is that you have to have a reasonable credit history. You have to show that even though you have debt, that you are paying it off in a regular manner. There is also a stipulation where you have to have at least try to get a loan with reasonable rates and reasonable terms from another bank and either been turned down by them or been offered unreasonable rates or unreasonable terms that just don't work for a farmer or rancher. It's important that you don't have any crop insurance violations and that you're not behind on any federal debt. Not that you don't have federal debt. That is okay to an extent that, that, that you're not in default or you're not behind on any of that. There are several types of loans that you can apply for at the Farm Service Agency. I'm going to cover two of the kind of big ones. The first are ownership loans. An indirect ownership loan can be used to purchase a farm or a ranch, either the operation or the land itself. It can be used to construct buildings or other capital improvements. It can also be used for conservation projects and to pay closing costs. The maximum amount that you can borrow on an ownership loan is $600,000, and it does have a term of up to 40 years for payback. The smaller version of that ownership loan is a microloan, and the maximum amount you can borrow there is $50,000. The term to pay back is a little shorter, it's only 25 years, but you can use it for those same purposes to purchase a farm or for capital improvements, Again, projects, it's just those that are not so expensive. The, another kind of loan is a direct operating loan. Now, operating loans you can use for better cash flow or if you need to buy anything that helps you run your operation. So it can be livestock, poultry, you can buy equipment. If you need cash for feed or seed or anything like chemicals, you can use an operating loan for that. You can also use it for the conservation projects, and also to refinance debts. There are some limitations to that, but that is an option. The maximum amount that you can borrow on an operating loan is $400,000, and the payback is much shorter. It's only one to seven years. Operating loans also have a smaller version, again, the microloan. You can use it for all the same reasons. The payback of a microloan is also one to seven years, but again, the maximum you can borrow on that is $50,000. So now we're going to refer back to a page of the quick guide that I re referenced earlier. And this is an illustration of what the loan process is. The very first step is to work on your application. And this application is known to be a tough one. It's tedious. It's a lot of information, but it's necessary for showing the farm service agency that you have thought about what this loan means for your operation and how your eligible and able to take this loan and use it to make your operation a greater success. We at SADA can help you work on this application to get a lot of this paperwork together, which most of it I'm sure you have. It's just a matter of putting it in a package and presenting it to FSA so they can see how you're going to use it and how it's going to make you successful. Once you put that application together, you finalize it and you submit it to the Farm Service Agency. And there are offices in most of the counties in Texas and across the US. After they receive your application at the FSA office, 
they will send you a notification of complete application. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're approved or denied. It just means that they've accepted your application, they've looked through it, and it has all the pieces it needs to have. It's just a checklist. They haven't reviewed it thoroughly. They just know that those pieces are there. Now, if you forgot something, if something got left out or, you know, something's not signed, they're going to let you know that that's an incomplete application and they're going to ask you to look at it again, make the corrections and resubmit it. After they've had a chance to look at a complete application and review everything that's in it, they're going to ask to visit your farm probably to do an environmental review, make sure it's it's where you say it is, it's in the condition you say it is, and that it's actually suitable for farming or ranching. They will take that information back and make a decision, and after that you will receive the decision letter by mail. It might be by email at this point, but you will receive that. Now two things can have happened in that review process. You could have been approved or denied. Now if you were denied, you can always talk to the loan officer about why you were denied. Maybe it's a credit history situation, or maybe they don't believe, they didn't see in your application that you were going to be able to repay it. It might be a situation where you can just go back to your loan application, make sure you, you gave them the truest picture, what the situation you're in, and you can correct it and resubmit it, and then go through the whole process again. The other better option is that you're approved. Now, what they'll do after that is that they'll verify that the collateral you promised is, again, available and proper, and then they'll go on to close the loan. You're going to review all the documents. You're going to look at the terms that they offered you, the interest rate that they offered you, and make sure that everybody's on the same page because this is going to be your guiding document for the life of the loan. Once you agree and they agree, you sign off on that loan and you can receive the money. Nowadays, it's not done. You won't get a check. It'll probably come through the bank. And then you'll just abide by the terms of that loan. So you'll make the payments when they're due. You'll report back or talk to the loan officer whenever they've um, outlined for you to do that. If you run into a problem, an emergency, a natural disaster, Anything that affects how you're farming, you should immediately talk to your loan officer and try to get some sort of uh, modifications or accommodations. Just always keep in touch with your loan officer and work with them throughout the life of your loan. It's, it's a great relationship to have. And as you're doing that, hopefully your operation is growing or it's successful in the way that you want it to be successful. You're, you're selling more, you're making more, and... You're just continuing that great work you do as a ad producer. As with any good government application, this one is fairly complex. It has a, a pretty good list of documents that need to be included and a pretty good amount of information. Uh, again, this list is available on that quick guide that is on that farmers.gov website. I'm going to go down this list and give you a synopsis of the kind of information that goes into each form. And then after this, we'll talk about the source information that will help you fill out these documents. The first one on the list is the 2001. This is fairly easy. It's your personal information uh, as you, the applicant. If you have a spouse, their information would go there too. It's contact information, company information. Uh, you have to give the reason that you want the loan. Uh, the amount of the loan that you're looking for. And then you'll have to sign off on some statements that say, you know, you don't carry that debt, you are 18 years old, all the information that makes you eligible for this loan. The second is the 2002. This is a three-year financial history of your farming activities. They are income and expenses for the three years previous to whenever you're applying. You should really be able to use your tax returns for the most part. Because like in your tax returns, you're including income from your sales, program payments, crop insurance payments, any custom work you've done. You also need to include expenses for the ag operation, the inputs, such as feed, seed, labor, uh, water, and also services. If you have to pay for insurances, if you had vet bills, veterinary bills, um, also utilities, any of the inputs that go into your farm operation. 
you also have to include non-operating income and expenses. So this would be uh, maybe outside employment, because if you included yourself or your spouse and you have an outside job, and also regular living expenses that you pull from any of that income. There are different sections. One is for financing. Maybe you already have loans and any changes in capital. So if you own real estate or large equipment or breeding stock and maybe you sold it during those three years, you bought some other pieces of capital or if you got it, like if you want it or you inherited some big pieces of equipment or real estate, you would include these all in the 2002. The 2003 is a three-year production history, and this is what you're growing or raising uh, in your ag operation. And what you list here depends on the type of commodity that you produce. Is it cattle, goats, chickens, hogs? And then you're going to be a little more specific. So if you have cattle, you're going to split it up into breeding cows, say, or market animals, or if you're going to sell them as calves. For Commodities such as livestock and poultry, you're going to include how many animals you raised or purchased in the year, how many you sold or even how many died, what was the average weight per animal when you bought them, and what was the average weight per animal when you sold them. If you grow crops, you're going to record the type of crop, so are they radishes or leafy greens or carrots, and you're going to include in there the unit that you measure them in bushels or pounds. You're going to record what your total yield was for that crop during that year, and remember it's three years, and how many acres you planted, and then the average yield per acre. So you're going to take the total yield divided by the number of acres. And this is to give some sort of uh, equality or equity between any size farmer. On that form also, you're going to show, to show some good business history, you're going to list some of your purchasers um, that you've had in the past or purchases that you, that you maybe have some commitments from, and you're going to include their contact information. The next form on the list is the 2004. It's an authorization to release information. This is just kind of a sign off. You're going to, it's saying that you're going to allow FSA to look into your employment records, your bank accounts, your credit, your collateral, like all your personal stuff. Um, again, this government business, it's very confidential. It, those things seem personal to you, but it, it's part of the business and um, you don't have to worry about that getting out. Form 2005 is a creditor list. Now this is a good time to request your credit report, which all of us should do probably at least once a year. And you're gonna take that credit report and make sure that there's not extra stuff on there or stuff that you think you've already paid off and you have evidence to that, make sure your credit report is as accurate as possible. On this form, you're gonna list all your creditors and the account numbers and the contact information for those creditors. And this is gonna include any banks that you owe, any credit cards and any suppliers. Any place that you owe money to, you should include on this list. Form number 2006 is property owned and leased. This so one's fairly straightforward. You're going to describe the lands you use. Even if you just have a verbal agreement, not a written contract, you should include those so that you can show that you have that at your disposal. Form 2037 is a business plan worksheet. This is the balance sheet. In general, these are your assets and your liabilities, what you have and what you owe at the time that you make an application. This is really just a snapshot of what your situation is when you make this application. This is a form that maybe doesn't come so easy to you, and we at SADA can definitely help you with this. Form 2038 is another business plan worksheet, but this one is for your projected annual income and expenses. This is gonna record the farm income and expenses and some of your personal that you can expect over a certain period of time, usually a year. And how you fill this out, again, depends on what you're growing and what the inputs that you're paying for. And this goes back a little bit to your production history. And you can use that kind of as a starting point. Form 2302 is a description of your farm training expenses. So the farm loan officers want to know what your ag experience is, and they want to feel comfortable that you're not just jumping into this because you had a, a whim, right? 
Um, you can include here any kind of formal training like college or school courses, and of course your real life experiences, both of which really are really important and you should describe on this form. And then form 1026 is a, it's kind of a combo of highly erodible land conservation and wetland conservation. This is something that the office, the FSA office will help you with, and they just want to make sure that you're not farming or misusing any of um, protected lands. Along with that long if list of documents that FSA requires, there's some additional documentation that you'll have to provide with your application. And these are files or documents that you probably have on hand or you can get a hold of. Uh, one is actually is the credit report. Um, you probably pulled your own, but they will want to pull, FSA will want to pull one for themselves. You'll turn in your tax returns, which should include a Schedule F. If for some reason you have been filing a Schedule C, a normal business filing, uh, that's okay too. Um, some copies of any leases or contracts or maybe purchase agreements or sales agreements that you have, those would be helpful. Proof of your legal name, and if you're not a citizen, you don't have your social security card, maybe a resident card. And verification of incomes, debts, assets, so that would be check stubs, um, any bank statements, credit card statements, just back up for the information that you've put into your into your forms. Now, if you're applying for a farm ownership loan, uh, hopefully you found you should have found a property, and you'll turn in the legal description of that property that you want to purchase for farming, a purchase agreement, any construction plans if that's part of what you're applying for the loan for. Now that you've seen that extensive list of forms that need to go into the application and the other documents that also need to go along in the loan application, you're probably wondering how you're going to get all that information. And I am willing to bet that you do have it. You have all the information you need. You just maybe don't have it in a way that's super accessible and usable. Remember that the forms 2002 and 2003 want three years worth of history. Now, if you don't necessarily have three years, we can kind of work with that and get as much as you can. If a loan is not in your immediate future and you think that two or three years down the road from now or more, you'll be applying for that loan, then now's the time to start keeping records of, of these items that are on this list. Your income and expenses, anything that has to do with farm or even off farm if you want it to be considered towards your loan application but also your production, particularly in these areas. If you have animals, you should keep track of the numbers that you purchase, um, the ones that you, the number that you raise, how many you sold, how many died, and weight information on those animals so that you can figure out in an average weight. And if you're doing crops, then the crops that you grow how much of a yield you get in each year, the numbers of acres you planted of that crop, and then also you're going to calculate a yield per acre, and then the payments that you make. And the payments might be the easiest part, especially if you're using a debit or a credit card and your bank keeps track of those. I mean, those are the numbers that are really important to filling out these forms and getting an accurate history, but also being able to make a good projection. This is the part of the presentation where I tell you how SADA can help you get through this loan application process to get all that information and turn in a good application to FSA. What we can do is help to create and then share with you a simple file for record keeping, and this is going to get you to the point where you're just able to fill in those those files those documents it'll probably be an excel file but we can ex we can customize it for your operation and then you download it onto your computer or your laptop and you update it as you need it if we have to we could even put it on paper if that's kind of where, where you're at we could work on a business plan together and a business plan is great, not just for loans, but also for grant applications or if you're looking at potential investors, 
It shows that you've thought about your operation as a business holistically, everything inputs, expenses, marketing options. Um, it's, a, it's a holistic way of looking at your operation. We can also help you complete the, the loan application. And it's something that we walk through together in getting all that information together and putting together a complete application to take over the FSA. This does bring me to the end of this presentation on farm financing with USD loans. Thank you so much for being an audience to this topic. I know it's not the most exciting, but it is really important and hopefully you've gained some information on how to approach a farm loan. And I hope you know that you can contact us at SADA at any time for any kind of assistance for that loan. I want to point out that we do have YouTube videos, not just farm financing topics, but production topics and business structures about co-ops and who houses. We have a really great variation of videos on our YouTube channel. You can search it by going to YouTube and looking up UTRGV Sustainable Agriculture and Rural Advancement. If you're interested in more information or um, any kind of information that has to do with sustainable farming, small scale farming, um, please go to our website at utrgv.edu slash SADA. And on there is a client intake web form. If you click on that link, it'll bring up a, a form. You'll enter your contact information and um, that way you'll it'll send it to us and we can we can get back with you. The other option is to contact me directly, which I'm happy to have you do. My email address is there, aisha.cruzreyes at utrgv.edu. Again, thank you so much, and uh, I hope to be seeing you soon. So there's a, a short-ish 25 minutes on the loan, an FSA loan package and all the information that goes in it. Um, I know the, the list is long, the, the, the number of documents is, is quite a few. And uh, I mean, this loan application is known to be, it's known to be a, a tough, a little bit tough, but please know that we're here. If you need help, we can do it over the phone. We can do it in person, um, online. We have those options to provide assistance. We have with us today, um, my coworker and a great farmer here in the Rio Grande Valley. And he has put together also a, a, a little video on how he himself used the FSA loans and, and different products to get himself uh, started and then established even more so in farming. And he's, you know, his name is Juan de Guasai. He's, he does a great job at not only being a farmer in the Rio Grande Valley, but also um, teaching and helping others to farm as well and to use all the tools that are available. Before I move into this farm ownership loan that we got, I would like to share a little bit of, about how we got there. Um, we moved here to the Valley in 2007 and we started borrowing a small, very tiny uh, space, a piece of land from a neighbor in West Laco. And we just started testing out varieties and different seeds. And from there, uh, we continue just borrowing a bigger space from another friend. And then we we found a um, four acres in West Laco that we started renting out. We, and because we were renting out and we have been farming for some time, we were able to um, register with the FSA as farmers. And once you do that, you're renting a piece of land, you, you can prove that you are a farmer, then you are eligible to apply for many different types of uh, loans that uh, were mentioned on this, on this presentation. And so that's how we got to that point after renting, we found up seven acres in Edinburgh that we wanted to purchase. We wanted, uh, all the, uh, many times, you know, the, as a farmer, you want to have your own space because you're investing um, energy and, and, and resources and, and you want to see it on a permanent place. It has benefits and it has challenges, but we decided to do it. And so we visited with the FSA uh, support staff and uh, it was uh, several visits but 
we were able to get the loan. And you can see in the picture, that's when we were signing up the paperwork and we became official uh, farm owners and we were very excited. Our farm has grown during the last years and uh, we have access to different types of USDA loans, but also we have received a lot of support from the NRCS, the Natural Resource Conservation Service, especially from uh, their EQIP program. Uh, one of the uh, support they provide within the EQIP program is land leveling. And our farm really needed to be level. You can see on the image uh, that's when uh, the, the land leveler company show up and to start working on the land, the tractors were here, they were in breath, uh, and then they have their laser level in the back. So I'll share a little bit more later on about how this land leveling help us. But um, I mean, pretty much NRCS cover all the cost of this land leveling. So it was very, very helpful for us to grow. So another part of the equip program is they can support you with flood irrigation, um, with the buying of the pipes and cover some cost of the installation. And you can see there, on the left, we were just uh, marking where the pipes were going to go. And then on the right, uh, when we were installing the pipes, uh, they had to go with us specifically slow. And the NRCS staff uh, stayed with us very close, uh, making sure that we were, we were doing it the right way. Uh, we can see here on the right, the water just flowing. And that was an advice from NRCS staff just to help the pipes and the ground settle before you start covering. So they give you all these tips to make sure that what you're doing is gonna last a long time in your farm. And later on, you can see uh, we have two uh, types of hoses there, or they call it a poly pipe, the one on the right, the other one is a lay flat hose. And so we were, uh, using drip irrigation on, on cilantro and it was already, I think beginning or mid-May and it was getting really hot. And so the drip irrigation, it wasn't enough. Uh, it was a second planting on those beds. So it, it wasn't really providing all the water requirements that cilantro was needing. And so, because the support from NRCA that helped us install those pipes and those valves, uh, we were able just to go quickly and, and purchase some poly pipe and set it up and go ahead and start irrigating. And our cilantro uh, turned into a success, successful crop. I'll show you some pictures uh, later on. So besides the farm ownership loan, later on as we were growing, of course, the needs for different equipment and different facilities came. And we didn't have the funds. So this time we accessed a micro loan, which is a uh, low interest loan that you can pay every year, which allows you to grow uh, two season, seasons uh, within the year and make some income to make your, your payment every year. So with the micro loan, it really, really helped us because we were able to purchase that tractor um, you know, with that tractor, we were able to run uh, bigger implements. And also, uh, you can see that we use it also as a forklift to load the pallets into trucks or to move things around uh, faster. We also, with that money, we built a small packing shed. We purchased those tanks to hydrocooler vegetables. We purchased an ice, uh, ice maker machine. And so it, it was very helpful. You can see because of the facility, little packing shed we built and the ice, uh, ice maker machine and, uh, you know, other, other things that we purchased with the micro loan, we were able to start growing more efficient and faster and better. And you can see your cilantro that was, uh, was later on sold at a, at a grocery store the state. You can see there the little packing shed where 
pretty much we make miracles uh, it's it's small and it has just the basic stuff in there but we are still able to do eight to up to 12 pallets and we really stretch it um, in that little space on the right also we we purchased a compost spreader which uh, it was a game changer because we were uh, spreading our compost just with a wheelbarrow and a shovel and it would take forever and it was very uh, labor intensive so once we invested on, on the compost spreader uh, we started covering a lot more area and uh, way faster and so this thanks to the microloan and those funds that we access we also um, were able to purchase a refrigerated truck that was one of the requirements to deliver to the cold storage facility in uh, South Far or yeah, South Far or Hidalgo. And uh, you can see ice on the broccoli. Uh, you know, we were uh, using it from the ice ice machine, and so all those things uh, we were able to purchase because of the micro and otherwise we wouldn't be able to do that big step and started growing more and be, being able to sell more. Another area that the equip program covers is support for farmers to uh, build a high tunnel. And so we were able to uh, build two high tunnels in our farm and of course, when you grow inside a high tunnel, everything grows better. I mean, the quality of your yield is better. And so we're very happy to have those high tunnels in our farm. And uh, that's another program we have been benefited with. And that's through NRCS Equal. They have helped us uh, with the cost of the cover crop seed in the past. And we really want to improve the soil fertility and quality of our soils. So that's been very helpful. That's uh, cow pea and sun hemp. Both are legumes and uh, they fix nit nitrogen into soil. And then uh, on top of that, they prevent soil erosion and uh, they are going to add organic matter once we uh, terminated them. We received uh, uh, some financial assistance uh, to basically just to, uh, you know, keep records of our nutrient management we're doing at the farm, making sure we are uh, soil testing and adding the right nutrients to our soils. So we received some um, financial support on those costs in the and they will cover part of the cost for soil testing every year. So all that support allows you to farm in a better way. And we are very, very helpful because without those programs, without those loans, we wouldn't be able to uh, grow the way we did. So those are some loans and programs we have used from a Farm Service Agency, the Natural Resource Conservation Service. and both have been uh, crucial for us to improve and to grow in our operation. And I really invite you to look into those if you're planning to expand or if you're planning to start uh, your farming endeavors. Uh, another thing I would recommend you to look into is the Texas Young Farmer Grant. Uh, this grant comes from the Texas Department of Agriculture and we were awarded uh, three times, I think three times, and that was also very helpful. So I want to finish by reminding you that uh, I'm in charge of the Beginning Farmer and Rancher program at the UTRGV. And uh, if you require or you are in need of a technical assistance or you have a question regarding this presentation, Please don't hesitate to uh, send me an email. My contact is right there on this last slide. And I thank Aisha again for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you, Juan, for that information. And if you anybody has questions specifically for Juan, he is online with us today um, and he can take those questions. 
I am going to turn our attention to a question that we, we have in the chat. And that question is, what are the top one or two pieces of documentation that folks really need to plan ahead to gather? And I will say that uh, in my experience, it's, it's the gathering part that, uh, that it's a little bit, that seems to be a little bit harder. Um, and that would be lists of creditors and the associated debt. And um, the, that might be a little bit of like out of sight, out of mind, you make your payments, but you don't want to know, you really don't want to know how much debt you have, but that's really important when you apply for a loan, one, so that you get a sense of what you owe and what your ability to repay is, but also so that you can make sure, say on your credit report, you can make sure that it's correct and you don't have any extra stuff on there that you've either taken care of, or maybe it's not even yours, because we know that happens. Another kind of piece of information or pieces is your records of, of harvest or of the number of animals or when you sold them, what you have in stock, your inventory, um, and what you've uh, kind of gotten rid of, what you've sold or, or uh, don't own anymore. And that'll give you an idea of how much possible revenue you've brought in or that, that can, can come in throughout the life of your loan. And again, that, that leads to uh, repayment. So I don't see any other questions at this moment, and I don't see any hands up, um, but please, Leslie, uh, Sandy, anyone that's on uh, right now, if, if you have any questions, just please let us know that you'd like to ask them. We are going to move on um, to our, my coworker, another of the wonderful SADA staff, Ms. Annalise Lotman, um, and she's going to talk to us a little bit about her program and what she has coming up. Thank you so much, Aisha. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. And yeah, I'm just gonna talk really briefly about uh, cooperatives. Co-ops are a, uh, a unique opportunity to make business ownership and in some cases, farm ownership, a possibility for, for someone who may not be able to afford it or may not feel confident be, be a, being a sole owner. And so we work with groups of people all over the state to help folks create businesses that they own together. And for farmers, this can be really key, right? There, so many small farmers are, are buying things at retail prices, farm inputs, seeds, uh, equipment, and then selling your product at wholesale prices. And so the working together with other farmers can help to increase the scale of the overall purchases that you're making in order to drive prices down. And it can be really helpful. It can also give you more selling power and more consistency in the marketplace if you're multiple farms selling together under, under a shared cooperative brand. And so we work with folks from every piece of the co-op development process from the idea all the way through to launching and really getting a business underway. There are not any loan programs that I've been able to find that specifically cater to cooperatives. So there are some SBA loans that are open to co-op applications. And so the Small Business Administration is somewhat supportive of cooperatives. And if employees are buying a business from the owner, there are some loans that SBA will work with you on. And in terms of USDA, there are grant programs and, uh, and at least one housing loan program that allows cooperatives as a business to apply. So that's just a little bit about co-ops. And uh, we've got training and free coaching going on all the time. So reach out to us at SADA, and we'd love to talk to you about any co-op ideas that you've got. Thanks, Aisha. So that does bring us to the end of our session of our webinar. Um, again, thank you for being with us, for tuning in. If you have any questions at any time, uh, please email us or go to the SADA web, web page and, and do that client intake, and we'll get in touch with you. Um, otherwise, we are in the Valley. We're at UTRGV. And um, we would be glad to visit with you at any time. So um, 
I guess that's it. Have a great day. Have a great uh, weekend. It's coming soon and I hope to visit with you soon. Thank you, Leslie.